Hello students, welcome back to another lecture from the online lecture series initiated by Shet Vidya Mandir, English High School and Junior College of Science and Commerce, Vasai. I am Mrs. Snehal Falkao. Good manners are the hallmark of a good character. Man is the most intelligent creation of God on earth as he lives in a society. Also, he has the capacity to think, talk and act. Thus, he knows how to act and behave well. This is called good manner. Good manners should be the essence of one's life. A well-behaved person is an asset to his surroundings and is loved by all. Good manners help bring joy and sunshine in one's life and also to the people around him. Today, we are going to study Chapter 2 from Section 1 of your English course book, which is all about good manners. Before we proceed, let us learn about the writer. Alfred George Gardiner was born at Kemsford in Essex. He was an influential British journalist and an editor. He started his literary career as a journalist. At the age of 37, he was appointed editor of the Daily News, London. Under the pseudonym that is pen name, Alpha of the Plough, he made regular contributions to the Daily News, the Manchester Evening News, etc. He improved coverage of both news and literature while raising awareness for social causes, in particular, a minimum wage for industry workers. His essays are uniformly elegant, graceful and humorous. The Pillars of Society, Pebbles on the Shore, Many Furrows and Leaves in the Wind are some of his best known writings. His uniqueness lies in his ability to teach the basic truths of life in an easy and amusing manner. He raised the question of morality in everyday life. On Saying Please Taken from his Many Furrows collection, in On Saying Please, A.G. Gardiner explores the theme of courtesy, civility, morality, responsibility and control. He points out the value of good manners in social life and emphasizes the importance of courtesy and politeness in daily behavior. He shows how polite speech and manner sweeten the atmosphere around and how discourtesy and ill manners spoil or pollute it. The writer begins by narrating a small incident. The young lift man in a city office threw a passenger out of his lift the other morning and was fined for the offence. Offence means a punishable act. It was a question of pleas. The complainant, that is, a person who brings an action in a court of law, entering the lift said, Top. The lift man demanded, Top, please. That is, he expected the man to be a little polite and say, please. And when the man refused, the lift man not only declined to comply with the instruction, but also hurled the passenger out of the lift. Hurled means threw violently. The lift man was undoubtedly in the wrong. Discourtesy. Discourtesy means lack of courtesy or rudeness. Discourtesy is not a legal offence and it does not excuse assault and battery. Assault and battery means an attack which includes not only threats but also the actual use of violence. The writer says that if a bugler, that is a robber, enters his house 
and knocks him down, the law will acquit the writer. Acquit means pronounce not guilty of criminal charges. And if he is physically assaulted by the robber, it will permit the writer to retaliate, that is, fight back with reasonable violence. The law does this because the bugler has broken the law, but no legal system could attempt to legislate, that is, make laws against bad manners or could allow the use of violence against some act which the law itself does not recognize as a legally punishable offense. This statement means that the law does not regard bad manners as a punishable act and hence does not punish those who display bad manners. We definitely sympathize with the lift man, but we must admit that the law is reasonable. If we are given the liberty or freedom to box or punch anybody just because we did not like their behavior or the tone of their voices or the scowl on their faces, then our fist would never be idle. That is, we come across rude and discourteous people so often that we would be busy all the time punching them and thus the gutters of the city would run with blood all the day. The writer states that one may be as uncivil as one may please and the law will protect him against violent retaliation. The writer says that one may be haughty or boorish. Haughty means full of pride and boorish means rude and uncultured. And there is no penalty or punishment except the fact that people would call him an ill-mannered fellow. The law does not compel, that is, force anybody to say please. The writer says that the lift man incident shows that it is probable that the lift man was much more acutely hurt because the man who he threw out considered the lift man inferior to him and thus the lift man's self-respect was hurt and thus he threw the man out. It is true that the pain of physical assault soon passes away but the pain of a wound to a self-respect poisons a whole day. The writer declares that bad manners are infectious, that is, just like an infectious or a contagious disease spreads from one person to another, if you behave badly or rudely or in an ill manner with someone, that person might transfer that ill temper to someone else. And this might just go on. To explain this, the writer tells us of an amusing incident described in Act 3, Scene 1 of The Rivals, which is a 1775 comedy by Sheridan. In this comedy, Sir Anthony is Captain Jack Absolute's father and Fag is the son's servant. The scene goes like this. When the character, Sir Anthony Absolute, bullied Captain Absolute, Captain Absolute went out and bullied his man, Fag. Whereupon, Fag went out downstairs and kicked the page boy. This shows how we pass on bad tempers and moods. Probably, the man who said top to the lift man was really only getting back, that is, trying to get revenge on his employer who had not said good morning to him because the employer himself had been henpecked at breakfast by his wife. Henpecked means harassed by constant nagging. To whom the cook had been insolent means disrespectful because the housemaid had back answered her. This shows how we infect the world with our ill manners. Bad manners probably do more to poison the stream of the general life than all the crimes in the calendar. 
देर आर अ लॉर ऑफ केसेज वेयर पीपल लिव अ लाइफ ऑफ मार्थडम मार्थडम यर इन दिस कॉन्टेक्सट मीन्स एन एक्सपीरियंस दैट कॉजेज इंटेंस सफरिंग अंडर द शैडो ऑफ ए मोरोस टेम्पो दैट इज बैड और इल टेम्पो बट इन ऑल सच केसेज द लॉ के नॉट बिकम द गार्डियन ऑफ आर प्राइवेट मैनर्स दैट इज इट इज नॉट पॉसिबल to cover the vast areas of offences and no court could administer a law to govern our social civilities our speech the tilt of our eyebrows and also our moods and manners that is there is no legal punishment for displaying bad manners or gestures or for using inappropriate speech or facial expressions Though it is true that there is no law that makes it compulsory for us to say please there is definitely a social practice which is much more older and much more sacred than any law which instructs us to be civil that is behave appropriately and the first requirement of civility that is politeness is that we should use words like please and thank you these words are the little courtesies by which we keep the machine of life oiled and running sweetly in this connection the writer features his friend the polite conductor by using this discriminating title he does not wish to rebuke that is criticize conductors generally he says many a times here and there we meet an unpleasant specimen here he is talking about some conductors who regard the passengers as their natural enemies as creatures whose chief purpose on the bus is to cheat them and to keep them reasonably honest the conductors use a loud voice and an aggressive manner but this type of conductors is rare therefore without any feeling of unfriendliness to conductors as a class the writer pays a tribute to a particular member of that class by narrating his encounter with this particular polite conductor the writer fondly remembers how he met this polite conductor for the first time when he jumped onto a bus and discovered that he had left home without any money in his pocket the writer states that everyone might have had this experience sometime and we know the feeling the mixed feeling when we discover that we have no money with us you are annoyed because you look like a fool at the best and like a knave at the worst a knave is a dishonest person you would not at all be surprised if the conductor looks at you suspiciously and says yes i know that stale old trick now then off you get and even if the conductor is a good fellow and lets you get down easily without shouting at you you are faced with the necessity of going back and the inconvenience perhaps of missing your train or some important event like your engagement Going back to the incident the writer remembers that he started searching his pockets for stray coppers means coins of very low value this statement means that he searched if he could find at least some coins here and there to buy a ticket but he found that he was totally penniless he told the conductor with an honest face that he couldn't pay the fare that is the money for the ticket and must get down to get the money oh you needn't get off that's all right said the conductor all right said the writer but i haven't a copper on me that is i don't have even a single coin to pay you oh i'll book you through the conductor replied where do you want to go the writer thanked the conductor and told him where he wanted to go and as the conductor gave him the ticket the writer said 
But where shall I send the fare? Oh, you'll see me some day, all right, the conductor said cheerfully. He turned to go, and then luckily the writer's fingers, still wandering in the corner of his pockets, felt a shilling. Shilling is an English coin. And he paid the conductor and settled the account. Here, he has used the account was squared. Account was squared means he paid the conductor and settled the account. In spite of this, the writer was very happy with the good nature of the polite conductor. A few days later, as the writer sat reading in the bus, his most sensitive toe of his foot was trampled, that is, stomped upon heavily. He looked up angrily to see who had stomped his toe, and it was none other than his cheerful friend, the bus conductor. Sorry, sir, the conductor said. I know these are heavy boots. Got them because my own feet get trod that is stomped upon so much. Hope I didn't hurt you, sir. He had hurt the writer, but he was so nice about it that the writer assured him that he hadn't. After this, the writer began to observe him whenever he boarded his bus and found a curious pleasure in the constant good nature of that conductor. The conductor seemed to have an inexhaustible, that is, never-ending fund of patience and a gift for making his passengers comfortable. The writer noticed that if it was raining, the conductor would run up the stairs of the double-decker open bus to give someone the tip that there was room inside. With old people, he was as considerate as a son, and with children, as solicitous as a father. Solicitous means showing concern. He had evidently a peculiarly warm place in his heart for young people, and always indulged in some merry jest with them. Jest is an activity characterized by humor. If he had a blind man on board, he not only helped him get down safely on the pavement, but he would call to Bill. Bill is the driver in front, to wait while he took the blind man across the road or round the corner or otherwise safely on his way. In short, the writer found that the conductor irradiated, that is, exposed such an atmosphere of good temper and kindliness that a journey with him was a lesson in natural courtesy and good manners. What struck the writer particularly was the ease with which he got through his work. Using the example of the bus conductor, the writer declares that if bad manners are infectious, so also are good manners. It is with manners as with the weather, says the writer, means manners are just like weather. Nothing clears up my spirits like a fine day, said Keats, and a cheerful person descends on even the gloomiest of us with something of the benediction of a fine day. It means just like fine weather cheers us up, cheerful people too brighten up the moods and ill tempers of the gloomiest of people. And this is how the fine weather on the polite conductor's bus and his own civility and his good-humoured behaviour infected his passengers. Enlightening their spirits, he lightened his own task. His gaiety, that is, his merriment and playfulness, was not a wasteful luxury, but a sound investment. The writer says that he has missed the polite bus conductor from his bus route of late, but he hopes that only means that the conductor has carried his sunshine onto another road. It cannot be too widely diffused in a rather drab world. 
This statement means that the writer just hopes that the bus conductor is still alive and fit and fine and has only taken another route where he is infecting people with his kindness. The writer states that he is not at all feeling sorry for writing a panegyric on an unknown bus conductor. Panegyric is a formal expressing of praise. He says that William Wordsworth gathered lessons of wisdom from a poor liege gatherer on the lonely moor. Similarly, he believes people also should take lessons in conduct, that is, how to behave, from such people as the bus conductor, who show how a very modest job may be dignified by good temper and kind feeling. The writer concludes by saying that we must get back the civilities, that is, politeness, if we want to make life kind and tolerable for each other. We cannot get them back by invoking the law, as the law can only protect us against material attack. Nor will the lift man's way help us to restore the civilities. The writer suggests to the lift man that he would have had a more subtle and effective revenge if he had treated the gentleman who would not say please with elaborate politeness. He would have had the victory not only over the boor but over himself and that is the victory that counts. Boor means an ill-mannered fellow lacking culture and refinement. The polite man may lose the material advantage, but he always has the spiritual victory. So dear students, what message does this lesson give us? It tells us that good manners cost nothing. One can be polite to others without making any extra efforts. We should use simple courtesies, that is, words like thank you, please, I'm sorry and excuse me. Such words of civility should be used whenever possible. Be thoughtful, be cheerful, be generous, respect oneself and others too. In this way, we can make a society kind and tolerable for each other. That's all from today's lesson. Thank you.